Welcome to the Horror Syndicate Discourse. I am Razor. I am one of four hosts that we normally have. Tonight, uh, it'll be Nate and I, and we're going to discuss two 1964 movies from Japan. Uh, and two movies I probably would have never watched if Nate wouldn't have brought up. They're both in the Criterion Collection. Uh, so generally, movies that are in the Criterion Catalog are top-notch films. And... I can see why both of these, I will say I prefer one to the other. One of them is an anthology, essentially for almost, you can think of them as uh, like campfire stories from Japan. And um, I think they're both all pretty much set in feudal Japan around the time of the samurai, which is really kind of cool. But uh, we'll get into that. Uh, Quieten or Kaiden, I, Nate has the pronunciation of the first one, and Oni Baba, are the two movies that we're talking about tonight. And they're two movies that you likely have never seen before, because uh, as Americans, generally we don't like to watch foreign film. And uh, unless you're like me and like to watch ridiculously bad Italian cinema. But anyway, uh, these are both available on HBO Max currently. And uh, I think, first of all, Oni Baba was the, my preferred of the two, so I would definitely check that one out because, uh, if not desensitized at this point, this is that's a terrifying type of movie, which we're going to get into. I'm going to bring Nate in here, and I'll, the first question I have for Nate, well, I got to get him in here first, is uh, what attracted you to these movies? By the way, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm L I V I N. L I V I N. Living. Yeah. Um, well, we you know we started doing this show. I think this is the third time we've done an episode where we watched two films we'd never seen before. Uh, it was just something I thought because you know, as horror fans, we watch a lot of our favorite horror movies over and over and over. And a lot of you times, we, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all we all have, and, and we all talk about. And a lot of times, our movies are movies that we've seen and we know very well. Mm. And I'm like. Well, well, there's so much out there, especially before our time that we haven't seen. So, you know, at first we did a couple of 70s films. I think we may have done one 80s film. Um, but I, for the last year, I've been like with going with that. Like, you know, there's a, there are decades of films that I never saw. And uh, going back to the Criterion collection um, and the, the Janus films, I, I noticed, were on HBO. They had all these films, which was a distributor that put out world cinema, like the best of, and Criterion's released a lot of those films. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so, you know, not a lot of horror, but I've watched a lot of movies in that group. And uh, I watched Yugetsu, which is a, a 1950s Japanese film. And so, you know, there's a few from the 50s and 60s that, I saw that that I hadn't seen, and I thought, oh, we should watch these because they're all on HBO. I think everyone has HBO uh, in the group, and I I've so. never seen them, and they haven't seen them. And these are not only considered great horror films, but great films, like classic films celebrated by cinemaphiles for year for years. And um, so I just suggested it. Hey, uh, I haven't seen these two. They're both Japanese horror films, same year, 1964. Which is a rare thing for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's that's what, that's what attracted me to them. Uh, just the fact that they are uh, great films. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew I was going to see good stuff. Um, you know, sometimes we like to get the, the, the bad ones. <laughs> That's kind of the fun part. They're, the, they're, the, the they're extremely fun, stupid, yeah. like that Frankenstein one was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> but then we find a good one, like, you know, the, uh, the Richard Attenborough film. Um, what was the other two we did? Uh, God, I, I'm having trouble remembering. <laughs> the one that really sticks out. Delirium. Was, and, Delir uh, oh, yeah, Delirium. What's the other one, though? It's remember. been so long since we yeah. did the episode. We haven't done one of these episodes. We had this long list and none of the never well, seen we, before were on there. And I was like, whoa, let's throw some in there. get consumed by Halloween, I think, is what yeah. happened in the holiday season. Um, uh, God, yeah, I can't remember. These but two, 
yeah, these two were just ones I said, I said, I think I want to check them out. And, you know, both, you know, not that we go care about Rotten Tomatoes, but both 90% or higher <laughs> rated films and, uh, you know, movies that played at can movies that some of, I think only Baba was Oscar nominated. Um, and didn't didn't you say that uh, Oni Baba in particular? Didn't you say Freakin it scared the hell out of him? Or did I read that? Yeah, somewhere? William Freakin. This one scared the shit out of him. Oni Baba said he said that this is one of the scariest films he's ever seen. And also, he used the fate the mask, the uh, what do they call it? the Hanya mask that's prominent on the covers and the stuff. Uh, that's what inspired the look of Pazuzu, the demon, which flashes mm. up. Oh, you can see it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, there's a few people who love it. Like, he loves it. Um, uh, Kai, Kai Dan is a... Uh, Roger Ebert said it was one of the most beautiful films he'd ever seen. Uh, and I think... I want to say freaking like that one, too. Uh, but these are these are films... I've, I really like Japanese films. Like this year, I watched every Kurosawa film but one. I've, I've seen everything that Kuros, Kurosawa ever did. Uh, and the hype is real. <laughs> you know, I had seen, you know, Seven Samurai, you know, Jimbo and all that. But then I was like, I, I've really seen maybe five Kurosawa films. And this guy is so celebrated. I mean, I wouldn't have Star Wars or, or, or you know, Good, the Bad, and Ugly and Fistful of Dollars or all that if it weren't for him. Yeah. And uh, so I just set out to watch all of his films. And I was like, I, I really got into Japanese films. I started watching Ozu. And so the two guys that made these two is uh, Kanato Shindo and Masaki uh, Kobayashi. And I had not seen those films. And then right before we did the show, I watched uh, Kobayashi did a movie called Har Harakiri, which um, I got for Christmas the Criterion release, and I'd always heard it was one of the best samurai films, and I was completely blown away by it. Like, it's just as good as any, I won't say of any Kurosawa film, but I was really impressed with it. So I was really looking, after watching that, I was like, oh, I can't wait to see Kai Dan, because same filmmaker. Uh, Shindo, I, I didn't really know. This was my first, only, only Baba, but I watched another one today called, uh, the Naked Island that he made before Onibaba, that Benicio del Toro, it's one of his favorite movies. Like he, he's obsessed with it. He, he actually went and met Shindo and set up a screening of it in Japan or, or somewhere. And uh, it was a movie that he really loved. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing more of these filmmakers. Like the, uh, uh, I, know, I watched another one called uh, Samurai Rebellion that uh, Kobayashi made that had Toshiro Mifune Mm. And the, and uh, oh, uh, Tetsuya Nakata, who is in Quiet On, he's in the second segment, The Woman of the Snow. That was and my he favorite. Was, of the, that was my favorite. Yeah. yeah. And he's he's also the star of Harakiri. And he was a star, he worked with Kurosawa. He was the star of Ran, the big epic he made in, 80, in the 80s. Um, so, yeah, I, I've really fall, I've, I've been on a kind of a, a Japanese kick. I was for a long time months ago, and now I'm back to it because of watching these two and Harakiri, and you know I want to watch Tokyo Drifter and stuff like that. There's a, there's a lot from um, you know again just I've been cons like consuming Italian and French and German and Russian and Japanese films, and Spanish films. We talked about one earlier. You said you saw a cinema. Paradiso, which yeah. I think is, is it Spanish or Italian? What, what is it? I think it's Spanish. Yeah, and I, I, I've been wanting to see it for years, so I finally bought it, so I'm looking forward to watching it. Um, but there's all this world cinema that a lot of Americans just don't watch, have no interest in, and unfortunately. And I, and it wasn't that I never had interest in it. I just, there's so much to consume otherwise. And I was, I was like, like you talked about, like, I was someone who watched a lot of movies over and over and over and over as a kid. Yeah. And then I started taking them seriously in college and I started exploring foreign and, and independent, but I still would watch movies over and over and over because I was single and had, nothing, you know, I want to watch Reservoir Dogs 400 times, you know, I want to watch right. Dancing Confused 500 times, you know, got the shirt. So um, I used to try watching anything, Robert. Um, yeah. Ebert just loved Kai Dan. So if you haven't seen that one, 
that's that's one he recommends. I watched it segmented also, by the way. I it's watched long. It, it is, long it, especially that third segment. It's the longest one. Um, yeah. There was another one that I want I want to check out. But I, by the way, Cinema Paradiso is uh, it's Italian. I don't know why I said Spanish. It's it's Italian. Um, by the way, you will love that movie because you like that Steven Spielberg movie uh, about Fableman. You know, yeah, so the, the the whole thing is a Cinema Paradiso is about this this kid who gets to be with or he he meets this guy who's a uh, projectionist and he develops his love for film and wants to become a filmmaker and th- you're gonna love it, I guarantee it. That's why um, I think you guys would like that Spirit of the Beehive, which was a uh, film I watched this week that was Spanish and it was about this little girl in 1940 who watches a screening of Frankenstein mm. that comes through her town. And she just becomes mesmerized. And what's really cool is the scene where she's watching it. The little girl, of course, she's like six. She had never seen it. The actress had never seen it. So they filmed her watching Frankenstein for real. Like, oh, wow. So it's really her reaction to seeing uh, specifically the little girl scene at the river. Uh, and Guillermo del Toro like worships that film and said, that movie is me. I am that six year old girl. Cause when I saw Frankenstein, it changed my life. Mm-hmm. Cause when I saw this movie, that's my life. That's cause she becomes obsessed with the monster, the creature and wants to find it and goes searching her, her village for the spirit or the creature. And, uh, I had seen a lot of people talk about it on a criteria. There's a show called the criterion closet where, celebrities or actors or directors writers people come in to a, a closet that used to be a closet i guess the criterion's headquarters and it's just filled of all their movies and they get to pick out whatever they want they give them a bag and they're like oh and they'll talk about a movie oh i'm taking this and i'm taking that and i saw a lot of people grabbing spirit of a beehive i think paul dano was one of the first to bring it up like he grabbed it um but yeah like so i'm really uh What's amazing is I'm watching, you know, people say, well, how do I get my time to movies? Because I don't know if they're good. Well, like if it's in the Criterion Collection, it's probably fucking good. So it's like I have this endless list of great movies that I know I'm going to probably like. And even if I don't, they're still good. You know, (laughs) Yeah, Nate, is Bones and All worth a $20 purchase? <laughs> I paid $20 and I loved it, but you know, that's a personal question. <laughs> it's yeah. up to you how you take it. Um, he had it ranked know. pretty highly on our top 25 yeah. of uh, 2022. So, yeah. Bones and All, I think it's one of the Is it out on uh, Blu ray finally? I don't think, I don't know yet. Oh. If it is, I want to own it. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see that one. Um, I wanted to ask you, did you get to see, uh, I think it's, I think it's called Kuroniko. No, it, but that's, that's a Shinto, Shindo film. Shindo movie. Yeah. And I haven't watched that one yet. That's, that'll be on the next. That one I saw, um, as I was looking, I watched Onibaba and then kind of, uh, kind of looked at his filmography a little bit. And I was, I, I saw a couple around the same time and this one sounds kind of similar, but kind of different. And it, it's it's one of the not there's not a ton of horror movies in his uh, catalog Shindo's catalog but yeah you know this was one of them that I kind of want to check out I don't remember if I saw if it was streaming or not actually let me look real fast I have the internet right here so yeah a lot of those guys they didn't make they didn't specialize in horror back then yeah you know filmmakers they they kind uh, of sp- spread it out yeah. it's it doesn't seem to be streaming yeah. I'll figure out a way. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, the menu. The menu. I've only seen the menu. Uh, I really like the menu, though. It's on HBO Max. They're way to too eat. different to decide. They're both great. They're both about eating, though. Right? One's well, yeah, both about eating. <laughs> <laughs> but they, I love both of them. I actually saw both of them like the same week or so. So they and they both jumped into my top ten of the year. That was it. Wasn't that like the last week before we? But it was like hell week watching, trying to catch up <laughs> on some of the, you know, mi- movies we missed. Yeah, because I thought oh, there's no what. Because I I went and saw the menu at, at the theaters with my daughter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the '60s. Sometimes we, sometimes we do. Sean is really. I think he's really young. Uh, 
1964 still doesn't seem that old to me. You know, like I saw some. I was looking up some reviews. Yeah, 1964 is like 12 years before I was born. So yeah, it's not that old. It's you it's know. hard to believe it's almost uh, 60 years ago. Yeah, you know, like I remember, like I was thinking of, I was watching something from uh, 1993 the other day, and I'm like, God, this is 30 years old now, and like it doesn't feel like it's 30 years old. You know, I remember when when movies felt like they were 30 years old back in you know in 1993. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, we've talked about even older before, like well, we talked about we, the Universal movies for a well, month. We talked and about Nosferatu, and that's and that's a uh, hundred years old. Have yeah. you ever seen the Great Train Robbery? The Sean Connery movie, or no, it's older? from 1903. Actually, I was so you know I'm going through uh, right fi finding all. I think it's called the tra Great Train Robber. Anyway. I'm going through the, all the films I've ever seen, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I keep going back to that class I had in uh, high school called Film is Lit, and that was one of the first movies we watched. It's from 1903, So, because my kids asked me the other day, what's the oldest movie I've ever seen? I was like, oh, well, it's got to be Nosferatu, and then I look at uh, Cat and the Canary. Is older than Cat that. And, Canary, and, and then so, if you watched any like the Charlie Chaplin, like a lot of his early. I've seen stuff. some of those in passing, but I couldn't tell you which yeah. I've seen. But then I came across like looking up older movies from the early 19, 19 aughts, as they said. And I found that one. I was like, oh my God, I've seen that. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, 1903, that movie's 120 years old. You know, so that's. As I was curious because there, I, I'm starting to like remember the movies that we we saw in that class because that's a class that I think you would have just devoured. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's anyway. So I was curious to see if you had seen it. So you're probably like 26. He's like Keith's age, probably. I bet. Saw so Scream opening or opening weekend. Mm, lung damage. I'm aware of it. It's from it's 20 uh, years old. <laughs> yeah. Leave a Copperfield for me. So, uh, anyway, Kaiden, is that how you say it? Kaiden, yeah. Okay. I think the I keep W pronouncing is. The w well, uh, I watched the video because the cool, I have the Criteria channel now. So, when the cool thing is, it has all the extras from the Blu rays. I and DVDs. how you're watching all that stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, they have like, there's a uh, Ernest Dick, uh, is that what his name is? The guy did, um, did he do, who was the guy that directed um, Demon Knight? That, Demon Knight? Was that Ernest Dickerson or something like that? Or Hood? I know who you're talking about. Yeah, he um, was talking about this movie. He was a big fan of Kaidan. He's on the on the Criterion channel talking about it. Because I have it somewhere over here. Anyway, yeah, he I like him actually. He's a yeah. He's got a lot of good things to to say. Big uh, films. Which one will we start with? Kaiden because it's a long Kaiden. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, like I said, it's, uh, this is Masaki uh, Kobayashi, who was one of the big filmmakers of that period um, in Japan. This was his first color film. And he really... <laughs> I, I just really dug this movie because it's like a fairy tale. It is like... The book... It, it's based on a book written by a guy named, um, shit, the names. This guy's not even Japanese. His name's Lef, oh, uh, Lefkadio yeah. Kern. Yeah. He wrote, and, uh, it's got 17 stories in it, and it yeah. includes something like insect biology in there. Yeah. Well. What a weird book. And Guillermo del Toro is like a big fan of this guy's writing, and he was he's a big fan of this movie as well. I forgot to mention del yeah. Toro. Um, and... So, yeah, this guy was kind of like the Brothers Grimm, but for Japan. He went around through Japan collecting these ghost stories and folklore stories. He married a Japanese woman, and this is back in, like, the late 1800s, I believe. And uh, he, he, he would hear the stories, and his wife would translate them for him. And he put these books out, so, and he introduced these, this Japanese folklore to, the, to America, to the, to the West. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know... So the book, the movie's based on four stories from his books. Two of them are from the actual Kaidan book, but there's the two others are from two other books that he published. Um, but yeah, they're, they're four shorts. It's an anthology film. 
which I, I thought would be cool to say, you know, we've talked about anthologies and on here. We, we, we mentioned how anthologies work really well when it's one vision, when it's one director. And I think this is a case. I think this should be considered one of the best horror anthologies ever made just from mm. filmmaking position and storytelling. But that's the thing. Like this is a different storytelling. Like it's, it's from Japan. It's not ours. It's the Eastern. Uh, and it's based on a lot of their folklore. And, um, and so Kobayashi was used to doing very more realistic films, but he wanted to really lean into surreal and uh, just so if you watch the film, you can see that it's all sets. Like, yeah, it's all built, and but it's but it's beautiful. It's like massive, like massive, like outdoor scenes, and but all like the all the backgrounds are painted, like paintings that the skies. And what he did to build this, this was actually the most expensive Japanese film ever made at that time, and um, the there were no there were no. Um, studio studios in um, Japan that were large enough to, to house these sets. So he found a, an aircraft hangar that was being used to store Nissan parts or build bodies. And that's where they built, they built the sets in this, this big aircraft hangar that was, I think 1100 yards long and 80, 800 yards wide. And they used a, a cyclorama to paint those, uh, skies on and for, so first of all that's what got me was how gorgeous those sets were and how beautifully surreal and phony they were you know there's like a almost like a play mm -hmm. nature to it but even more further because there's so much money there <laughs> like there's so yeah. much um and well, then go ahead it gives, it, i was gonna say it, it uh, you you said it but it does give it this great surreal quality and it feels like their stories being told you yeah. know by, like that's why i said they almost remind me of and we can't say campfire because i have no idea of japanese culture how they would tell <laughs> ghost stories but that's kind of it's just the, ghost stories yeah. right that's the kind of feel i had was that somebody sitting around telling these ghost stories well, I saw someone on Amazon complain about it, saying, oh, the sets look so fake. It's not realistic at all. And I thought, because it's not supposed to be, it's a fairy tale. They're fairy right. tale stories. Like, do you criticize the Princess Bride because it looks like a set? I mean, <laughs> so many things in Princess Bride is so fake. Yeah. But that's part of the charm and the, and, and, and the, the, the nature of it. All those mov fantasy movies we grew up watching, you know, never, uh, never ending story, all these things. They're, they're obviously done on sets and they're not mm -hmm. really trying to be real. You know, Labyrinth there's, there's is one that comes to mind. Labyrinth. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and part of that's what's fun about it. And I, I think as a filmmaker, this guy is like, you know, I'm going to lean into this fantasy world. And uh, all of them are, I think, broken up into seasons too. That's part of why I chose some of the stories. Um, but, I think we should just, I guess, jump into, I guess, segments, maybe, because there are four. Yeah. The, the first one is the black hair. The, which I was going to say, there's watching that one is quite interesting uh, because I feel like some of the later J-horror movies may have gotten their... Uh, they, 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 you could feel the presence. You know, I, I can't yeah. find the words that I want to say, but you know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to say. The influence. The influence. Um, there it is. There's a yeah. word. You can feel the influence from. The, it has to be from this, with you know the long black hair, the kind of like jump scare, almost jump scare. Uh, a couple. Well, the one scene for sure when he gets home and you know to his wife and you know. Uh, oh. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. The thing that jumped out at me immediately in this movie that I absolutely fucking love was, um, hey, Jax, what's up? Hey. Um, the use of sound, like there's score, but the score is sound. And this is the use of sound and the use of no silence. Yeah. Silence. Yes. silence <laughs> exactly. Like, you, you could hear the room tone hiss come up almost like they turn that up as part mm -hmm. of the sound design 
which I was like, I love this silence. Like there's, there's just silence. And like when you, you come into that, that house in the very beginning, kind of overgrown and dark, mm-hmm. it's really creepy. That silence. The, the music was done by a guy named um, Toru Takamitsu. And he was inspired by a composer named John Cage, who worked in weird sounds. And the way he he would kind of create these sounds. And what thing, one thing they would do is they would put like pennies or screws or wool or something on the piano wires. And when they would do that, it would distort the sound that they would that the piano would make. And then he would use those isolated and pop them in. And not only is it like you, the cool thing of uh, of of his use of sound. Or, or, di- or lack of sound, but like there's a lot of a lot of the movie where there's no um, ambiance sound. Mm. Like there's you can't like people are doing things, but you don't hear. Like you can see horse run by, and you don't hear hoof uh, the hoof. Mm-hmm. You don't hear uh, fabric moving. You don't feel. You don't hear any sound design. You don't hear any foley work. Uh, and he's using that to affect where it just kind of puts it off or just has this eerie feel to it that I thought was really cool. And I was like, wow, there's no, there's no sound design there. Like it's, he's, he's complete silence, but he's got that silence kind of turned up and then you'll hear these weird noises. Uh, one is like, I think like ice breaking and, and like, and like really amplified and some of it was uh, mixed and, and, messed with in post uh, but that whole opening where we're going into the house is immediately i felt creeped out uh just from the sound design and the beautiful cinematography and lighting that he used um but that first story the black hair is about a, a samurai who is poor from his master you know a lot of ronin you know they would um yeah, if, if their uh, the house that they would take care of, that's where they would eat. You know, if it got they were they would be out, they'd be out of money, they'd be out of food, they'd be out of work. And so this samurai is poor, him and his wife, and he's tired of being poor, so he actually just fucking abandons his wife. Mm-hmm. Horrible, I mean, it's a horrible thing. I mean, <laughs> he leaves his wife and marries this rich girl, and but he's unhappy in his marriage, and he keeps thinking about her, remembering. Oh well, maybe money isn't what's important. Uh, she was beautiful. She was wonderful. She she was very uh, giving, and so he decides to leave his new wife and go back to his ex wife. And when he gets back there, she's still there. She's weaving, and but she tells him that things have changed, and he's thinking about her beautiful black long hair yeah. and the scent of it and everything. And we won't give away things because some people have probably have not seen the movie. Um, yeah, that's what I was trying not to do. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if you want to I see do, them, they're on HBO yeah. Max for free. You know, so. Yeah, and that, that the thing is, like, there's some. That's the the most striking thing about all four of them, really, is the absence of sound at times, like you were saying, and then there are a lot of hard sounds, like especially in the third uh, story. Yeah, that uh, I'm not sure what that instrument is, but Uh, B B Y. It's like that. It's like a stringed instrument that people kind of associate with Asia. And yeah, it's uh, it was really because he was telling the story, and you know, you hear that brown the the hard sound, you know. But anyway, uh, yeah, I liked this one. Um, Yeah, I like that's probably my second favorite. Was the first. Oh, yeah, we we probably should have talked about the, the credits also how oh yeah the, the ink yeah the water. It, so i felt uh, like a cerebral vibe from the, the the yeah the way that they put the credits together I, that's another thing i wanted to mention was how interesting it was again, again the sound there's no like no sound in, yeah. it, with the credits it's it's such an interesting choice but then there's like little stings or little noises odd, odd yeah. noises they come out of nowhere. They're not come like they're not. I think it just creates this off-putting, uncomfortable mm-hmm. overall feel to the movie immediately. And, and too, immediately yeah. from the credits, like it's yeah. not like the sounds don't drop in on on the rhythm or uh, you know like when you kind of even if there's no sound, you have this 
when you're editing, you know, you're like, okay, this is where the sound comes in, or this is where something comes in, or this is where the cut happens. And, and if you play around with that and experiment with it, you can create things that, you know, aren't well, unexpected. It's, yeah, so the, the, the credits set up this otherworldly feeling you know it's not reality it's it's def you definitely get that feel like there's something about is was it ink they used is that what it was yeah it's like ink and water so yeah it, there's kinda... something about the way that worked it kind of messes with your mind a little bit you know like in watching that and that's kind of like why i was like did i say cerebral <laughs> anyway um yeah i really I, that, that kind of grabs you especially with not much sound it's, you know i'm like when I was watching, I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it's, it, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to feel about this. And then you get uh, the, it's like a long credit sequence and and then you, it stops and you kind of almost get a still, still frame and it gives you the title of the, the set, which I like that by the way, the way they introduced each segment. Yeah. Um, which uh, the black hair, is that what it was called? Yeah. Yeah. I think that was the second, my second favorite of the four um what's the second one is i think both of our favorites yeah and well the thing is it's so familiar that one i think yeah that one's more based on a um that one's a more known japanese folklore legend well they, they about the the yuka ana the yuki ana did did you notice though like like it's uh tales from the dark side the movie took the story completely well, they did well, yeah, I, haven't seen, you know, I haven't seen that in a long time. Okay, so you know, um, God, I can't remember his name. He's a good character actor. He plays Dexter's father. Oh, what James Remar. It? Yeah, yeah, James Remar. Yeah. So he he's a struggling artist, and he witnesses a gargoyle kill somebody, and he says, "Don't ever tell anybody about me." And eventually, he meets this beautiful woman, and uh, they fall in love. He has children, and then he finally confides in his wife to. It's a retelling of this story, essentially. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was watching. I was like, "Holy shit, this is." Well, it's this like is, it's like a Japanese bad. vampire story, is what yeah. it really is. Like the the Yukiana is apparently like a really big folklore legend over there of a woman in the woman of snow. I think which is what mm. the title was. Yeah. Um. Where I think a lot there's a lot of variants of of that that legend, and a lot of it involves a woman who tricks people into saving or helping her like travelers will stop and she'll be like holding what looks like a baby mm -hmm. and um nate saw skin rink by the way he was yeah not, or sean was asking um and usually it causes people to freeze to death yeah because of it so yeah this movie uh this segment stars um Tetsuya Nakadai, who was in Har Hari Kari, and he was in Ryan, and High and Low, and uh, Sanjuro, the you know, Jimbo. So he's been in a lot of stuff, and he, he's like a really great actor. He plays a young man. So it's him and this older guy who are wood, wood carvers who were lost in the snow and take refuge in this hut. And he wakes up in the middle of the night and sees the Oki, Yuki Ono, or was it Yuki? <laughs> Yuki Ono. Like breathing on him, basically sucking him in blood and killing him. Yeah. And she doesn't kill him. She's because he's young, and she tells him that she's going to spare him, but he can never tell anyone, or she'll come and kill him, basically. And you already kind of talked about the tales of the dark side, how it kind of follows that he meets a woman, falls in love, has children, and he has you know, a great life for ten years. Great life. Yeah. yeah. And but then she he, never ages. Yeah. Like no. a vampire. <laughs> All yep. the people are like, wow, she's what's her secret? She's had three children and she doesn't look any older than the day she when she got here. Which the the thing is, if if I hadn't seen like that, that's the worst part about seeing, you know, some modern cinema. First of all, you don't know where the stories come from. So that was always original to me. I was like, that's a great story. But like I, I wish I would have seen this earlier before that, which I would have had to see it in like the 80s. I, I wouldn't have understood. But like because the the twist at the end would have been just you know what I'm mean? saying like yeah. was Chef's Kiss. But I, I unfortunately I did see it coming because I was like I was drawing the parallels to that Tales from the Dark Side segment. But this was really well told and 
I like the the one thing that I liked was um, the scene where he the you know the winter cold kind of brings back the memory to him. Yeah. And go ahead. No, you were talking. Oh yeah, no, I, you look like you're about to say that. But you know that 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 kind of like that was his that that moment. As soon as he remembered that, you're like, shit, he's gonna mm-hmm. tell her. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you you kind of knew like what was going to happen but it was i i, I just liked the, the this was my favorite i, I yeah it was easily my favorite yeah. and, and oh the, the eyes in the sky mm-hmm. watching oh, yeah, the, the eyes time. in the sky were so weird it, was so cool. it felt like there was somebody always watching from the dis- yeah, distance like know? her i guess yeah I guess. yeah it had to have been her uh, sure he didn't say anything you the know? thing i find interesting about the, that segment is well not about the segment itself but you, know, you talked about the length of the film. Mm. The, the version that's out there now is three hours long. Yeah. Which is intimidating to anybody. But then you're like, well, it's four segments. You can break it up, watch it. That's um, I did it. <laughs> but the thing is, like, when they made it in 1964, you know, he wanted he wanted to submit it to Cannes Film Festival. And that year, Cannes had decided they were not going to screen anything that was over two hours long. So... He's like, well, shit, they're not going to play my movie, but I wanted to play there. So he went through and tried to cut as much as he possibly could out of the movie. So he got it from 180 minutes to 160 minutes. So he cut 20 minutes out of it, still realizing I can't cut anymore. Uh, but it's still too long for Can. Mm-hmm. So when he submitted it to Can, he submitted it without that segment. He cut the. He should have cut the last segment. (laughs) Yeah, the last segment was my least favorite, easily. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, but maybe because it was not long enough. It's only like twenty minutes or something. Yeah, it's the shortest, I think. Uh, But uh, yeah, so the the, to me the best segment he cut out for the can screening. Um, And what happened was Toho had put it out, and the original cut, the full one eighty minutes, was lost for a long time. Yeah, because the DVD, I think, was released at two hours and 40, 45 minutes, maybe. Yeah. And so it, it's the a criterion years. is the only version that, that they found the footage, right? Yeah, they found, uh, before he passed away, they they were able to remaster the 161-minute version, that that the second cut, I guess. And that was the one that was out for a long time. But then they found... They found the footage at Toho. Toho had all these like unmarked canisters, and he took them and <laughs> we used to we used to talk about that in junior high because it was on <laughs> every night. Everything's not about these movies. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's talk about the weather. Um, anyway, like they found the canister, they were able to remaster the whole full original vision of the movie that we now get to see. Yeah. Uh, I do think. The 161 minute is probably tighter, and maybe some of this does drag at times. Uh, I could I w- see that s- in in the in the third segment. Yeah, I felt yeah, I felt there were some parts that were, but like the first two, which in my opinion, are pretty the best solid. Two, they're pretty solid. Yeah, I don't think they could be shortened up. Uh, the, the fourth little. one. I gotta be honest. The fourth one was the last one I watched, and I honestly barely remember any of it. The, the, the only thing that keeps coming to mind uh, for me is the guy seeing the reflection of his his enemy in the water, and I remember the scene where he just tosses the damn bowl <laughs> out of it. You know, that's, that's all I can really remember from that one. But well, the, the cool first... thing, the only I think the only interesting thing about that segment was the whole notion of how not every story has an ending. Sometimes, yeah, no, writer could think end. of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, the last segment, uh, you know, I could have stopped after the third. I do like the third. It is long, but I do like that one. The third one was called the, um, Hoichi, the earless. Yeah. The earless. Yeah. And I thought it was kind of cool. It has a lot of great visuals, but yeah, like you said, it's like this, this blind kid who plays the, the blind the monk who, B, who, yeah, monk, I guess. Yeah. yeah. He's plays playing the that, that instrument. Yeah. And He's, He's seen, telling this great story of this battle, yeah. it, but it's like so drawn out. Like the the visuals of the battle itself, that was cool. Re- yeah, really cool. They start uh, with the, the the battle, which mm-hmm. is this real battle that happened in I think 
the 1300s or something like that yeah like the 1300s or, or, or something no i think it was actually earlier than that i think it's like in the uh the earlier the 12, than that? 12, i think it's in the 12th century hmm. i think the movie itself where he's telling the story it's maybe in the 1300s 13. okay but I think the uh, the initial battle was a civil war in Japan. Yeah. Uh, between these two clans, and they had a sea battle, this famous sea battle. Uh, and the emperor on one side, or the emperor at the time, was a six year old child. Mm -hmm. And their side is defeated. And to keep him out of the hands of the enemy, uh, his grandmother jumped in the water with him and they drowned. And then the mother jumped in after them. Um, so what we have in this movie is the spirits of those people visiting this blind monk because he sings the story about this, their story, and he visits them. A, a samurai shows up, a ghost samurai shows yeah. up, requesting that his emperor wants him to come sing this to them. And when he gets there, he sees all of them. But what's really there is he's in a graveyard. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's a really cool story. It's a really cool ghost story. It's definitely definitely different from yeah. uh, anything that you really would ever see, especially when they get down to uh, that whole scene, the intricate putting the text all over his body. Yeah, they're trying with, to put like a sutra on him to protect him. Yeah, and so when the when the samurai comes back. He can't. They, he's not supposed he to be able to see, see him. him. He can see his ears because they didn't draw on his ears. Yeah, and they take I, well, his ears. <laughs> I like that the one guy. I can't remember what. I don't remember their names, unfortunately. But well, the, the one priest guy, that like, did the writing was uh, God to share uh, Shimura. Um, Takashi he's a, Shimura, he's who a bigger was in, name actor, right? Oh yeah, he was in Seven Samurai. He's yeah. like the star of Seven Samurai. I also to share. He was in like all of Kurosawa, like Irkuru, and he's in like he's he, yeah he's in Godzilla. I mean he's in. Uh, yeah. He's a great fucking actor. He, but one of my the, favorites. One of the things I enjoyed about what he said was he said, just be still, don't react or something like that, and it'll it'll pass. You'll be fine. But they forgot to fucking put the <laughs> the suture or whatever <laughs> on his ears. So when it like the the you gotta love the old 1960s effects of uh what a ghost is, because the samurai comes over and you can kind of see through them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what that effect is called. But uh, and then you know from then you get to see his perspective and you see the monk, but all you can see is like everything's in, like invisible, but his ears. Opacity's down. The best part when Helena comes downstairs, she's like, "Why can you only see that ghost's ears?" <laughs> <laughs> like, well, but then like like he tries to get him to respond, and, and the monk is doing what he's supposed to be doing, and then he just grabs his fucking ears and just massacres his ears basically because that's all he can do anything with yeah he has to take them back yeah uh so yeah I, I really dug that one too but yeah that last one is called a uh, cup of tea or something like that oh, yeah, yeah the, the guy stops off and he grabs his cup of tea and he looks in and he sees another man looking at him from the reflection and he like looks at oh it's weird but he drinks it so i think what has happened is he's drank the guy's soul yeah so he's got like this guy's soul, and then the, his he comes for it back, and he like chases him off. Everybody thinks he's crazy, and then like three other soldiers who are ghosts, who or I guess are his servants, come to fight him, and he fights them off. And and but it's one of those, like I said, it starts from the beginning, saying there's no ending to the story, and then it cuts back to the guy who's writing it, mm. and then they all freak out because you know, well, we won't give it away, but yeah, um, yeah, I I thought again overall. Uh, I really dug the movie. It was really attractive looking movie. Um, they ran out of, again, it was a lot of money. They ran out of money making it um, when they were filming the earless sequence. That was the last one they shot. And uh, the director went to a friend and said, I, I really need to borrow 10, 10 million yen to finish this film. And the guy said, "I'll give you the ten million yen, but you're going to regret if I don't if you did that you didn't ask me for fifty million yen." <laughs> and so when he got it sent to him, he actually sent him the fifty instead of the ten. Oh, so, wow, that's cool. And he kind of took care of it and like was the one distributing it. So like, but he even said like they, uh, Toho had sent like a hatchet man to watch over the prop because you know, they it was an expensive movie. And they said Dan he ended up joining our side because he liked the movie so much because he was watching it being filmed. Um, but I don't know if I have any 
I wrote some notes down if, before we jumped to on, on me, oh, the other one. If, I don't know if I have anything else. I was just going to say uh, it's easy to wash these broken up into yeah. segments. I, I think, like, I get that it's an anthology and you can watch them straight through, but I think it strengthens each story to watch them separately. Like, watch one, take a break, come back to because that's how I did it. And it was uh, much more enjoyable for me. I could because then you kind of get looked at them as individual films, which I know that's not what the filmmaker wanted. But uh, overall, um, I I think my favorite was the second one, the Woman of the Snow. Is that what it was called? And then the black hair and the the my 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 only knock on the 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 earless or whatever the, the, I can't remember <laughs> the title of that one was the length of the like. He took long pauses in between what he was saying when he was telling the story, and I understand why he was doing that. Uh, but I did like the visuals of uh, the battle; it was really cool, especially yeah. uh, on the water and these little skiff boats they were using. It's really cool stuff, uh, and most of this stuff is set way back. Um, That's all medieval yeah, times. Yeah, big feudal time. Japan. Yeah. yeah, feudal Japan. So a lot of great looking costumes as well. And Except I, for the guy writing, I guess. The well, guy yeah. writing the story, I guess, is more contemporary at the, yeah. maybe the, in the 60s. But uh, my one of my favorite things, though, is is that scene where he's getting sutured you know, with all the <laughs> writing on there. It's like how how small and intricate the each you know character is. It's like, Jesus. And they put him on his eyelids and yeah. everywhere but his ears. <laughs> but his ears. <laughs> so you know he's in trouble. But, yeah, overall, this was a very interesting watch. Um, I, I I really like the second story very much though, and I'm mean, the first one that really gave me like Juwan and and Ringu uh, vibes. Uh, yeah, of, you know, not like completely vibes, but you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, I think you do. This guy loves you. He loves me. Yay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so like we do, and I know what you're gonna say already. Uh, with uh. Say the title again, Kaidan. 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 Would you recommend it? Definitely. Okay. Yeah. yeah, me too. Uh, and it's on HBO Max. Um, if you if you feel, oh, by the way, that's the other thing is uh, there's a there's a lot of weight to this movie. Each segment, I wanted to make sure to say that you feel the weight of it. Um, but yeah, it's on HBO Max. If you want to check it out. Uh, Definitely check it out. A Criterion, I believe, has a Blu-ray, which I'm sure is chock full of special features too, which would be kind of fun to dig into. Uh, did you get that one? On uh, are you going to get that one? I'll probably eventually get it. Yeah, I don't have it right now. Did it make your top 100? Uh, it could. Like I said, I already had the list, so it's kind of. I'm like, I had like a couple spots open as I'm watching other stuff because I just watch new movies every day. Yeah, and the movies uh, watching. Only Baba popped up on your list. Yeah, only Baba I put in because I did like that one more. Uh, so I thought that, oh yeah, I got to have that on there. Only Baba. Let's, let's get into it. Cause that okay. one, that, that I preferred this over uh, the last one, but not like, I mean, they're not, not, not easy like to by a mile or anything. Yeah, no, but... it's, it, they're not really easy to compare, but uh, first of all, I like the monochrome, black and white for, yeah. especially when it comes to that mask that's that mask is very striking that and the the, the setting that gra high grass that high grass and the low angle shots yeah. it felt so oppressive that movie yeah you know did you did you get the that movie, feeling when you were watching yeah how the it movie was? was alarmingly violent and sexual and primitive and yeah it was. I could see why William Freakin thought it was one of the most terrifying movies he'd seen, or one of the scariest films. Because it, like, it, you, you have to be in the right frame of mind watching it. Because it's one of those, like you said, really scariest movie. Um, but it really is if you really look at what's happening in these these people. And um, I guess we should jump into like what it's again medieval times. It's during the Civil War in Japan, and it's from the perspective of people the peasants trying to survive and uh, oh i love that opening scene all you see is oh, these man. Two samurai 
they're they're walking through this tall well, they're running aren't they they're, they're yeah well yeah they're they're traveling <laughs> through yeah. this tall grass and then all of a sudden you see these blades like spears or whatever spears, they were come yeah. out of nowhere and you're like what the it was almost like a ghost mm-hmm. would you know and it was really cool then you, you see these these two women the mother mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law who were stealing their armor to survive essentially and it's then like, they throw them down this black, dark pit. It's so dispose of the bodies. It's you know? so cold and systematic the way they do it. Like it's yeah. like they just stab them and then they're on them and they're ripping shit off yep. of them. And then they're and you the, the, the one thing you got to think about though, like that I I took away from that is these are samurai warriors. Yeah. I mean these are the 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 top notch warriors and they they get taken down by two women very easily because yeah. they're in that tall grass. You know, and they strike right on like their said, land. Like, yeah, yeah, they really walked cool. into a trap that they don't yeah. know. Oh yeah, and like I said, they they yeah they drag their bodies down this big giant hole that they've dug, and they just dump their bodies down in there, and they take all their armor and their swords and their weapons, and they take them to a a guy to sell them for food or whatever they could get, yeah. and he's just like this opportunist where he's got like naked ladies laying around and he's got like all this stuff and he's like yeah until the war's over i'm sitting fat you know and like so he's like milking it as much as he can war he's profiting he's a profiter Mm -hmm. off of this war and like even like as they're leaving he's like talking to the lady like hey you know i'll give you this if you if you fuck me basically (laughs) it's like you know it was creepy too yeah they're like just, just they're living in this very depraved dark i mean can you imagine like watching like the force awakens and ray's trying to get her her scavenger and he's hey uh give me a bj i'll give you some more i'll give you another one on car plot doing that or whatever (laughs) yeah Yeah. you know like that's basically what we're seeing and like someone who's scavenging to survive they have no they they don't have anything and they have no men the, no. her, her husband and her son, their they, son. They're waiting for him to come back. Gone off to war, yeah. With this, yeah. and then this one guy comes back who was with them and says he was killed. Yeah, and then and, he takes the opportunity. And the girl, the the young girl, it's like I I was reading about this uh, director Kanito Shindo, I think is his name. Yeah. Um, uh, like how very sexual his other movies are, and and. Like this one kind of jumps into that, but the it, it's all in service to the story though because yeah. of what the mother-in-law does. I mean, you feel like she, first of all, she doesn't approve when the girl goes off with Kanchi. Is it was it Hachi? Hachi, yeah. Uh, you know, he's a vile goes, character too. Like you say, he comes back and he's talking about and he's dead, but he also talks about how he got his clothes from killing a monk or something. Yeah, like kill like a priest. He was it. he was a creep and they were all beasts. Sicko. Yeah, slime ball, really. Yeah, yeah, and but like the but, the, but they had to be to survive. Oh, it's yeah. all about survival. That's what's really I think that's what's scary. I think that's what freaking talk about. It's like it's like when you strip away rule, they're living in a lawless world during the war where yeah. like it's it's kill or be killed uh scavenge whatever you can i mean they're murdering these samurai like that was a terrifying scene where the samurai are fighting each other across the river and they come across the river and he's calling for help and they just like kill them right there like just yeah. immediately like piranha on a, on somebody just attacking them in the water killing them and taking their shit and dumping their bodies in the holes dumping again. Their bodies in that pit, and the, the 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 best part is later on in the movie. Not the best part, but about the pit in general is whenever you know she goes the with the guy with the demon mask. You know he doesn't reveal his beautiful face or whatever, but you get to see more into the pit and like how the, bones, the bones that are piled. It's like they've been doing this for a while. Yeah. You know, yeah. And then she like goes down there to get his shit. Yeah, yeah she, like, well, she like, has to. She has to yeah. go down there because she needs that. And then that mask, you know, that that's such a, a unique looking mask, you know. And she puts it on because she wants to scare the uh, daughter in law. Yeah, think, we, like we get into that whole thing of the sexuality and sexuality because he said he, you know, a lot of movies where they show nude because this movie has a lot of nudity, a lot of sex going on, and I think it got an X rating in England when it came out. And, um, but what he said is like, usually when you show that stuff in movies, it was to get attention. Yeah. And he wasn't doing it to be exploitive. He was doing it to, to, to capture, 
again, this is about humanity at its core. We will murder and kill and steal and do if we if it means survival, and that's yeah. what they're doing. They're not killing because they're they're psychopaths. They're killing because they have. That's how they survive. It's like I'm going to murder. Who do I who, who do I kill? Anyone who comes around, I'm going to kill them because they may kill me, and that's what happens. I mean, uh, Hachi gets killed by another deserter. Like he gets killed by somebody like him, basically. Basically, yeah. Um, and so the sexuality thing is, yeah, like. It's it's the woman who's lost her husband, but she starts to, you know, lust for him because she just because humanity kind of sex is one of our primal base things that we that kind of make existence existence. And so despite what's going on in the world or what's going on in the situation or who he is, he's a man, she's a woman and they want to get down. And that's what happens. And. And the, the mother-in-law's not she's mad, but she's also jealous. She yeah. wants she wants some dick. <laughs> you know? well, there's, a, I think to there's, there's a ton going on with her though, it feels like. Yeah. Not just that. Like I think she's has fear of uh well her being left. Being she left. She can't do yeah. it. She can't do it on her own. No, no, there's no you know, yeah. she couldn't. And yeah. and that's what that's what prompts what happens in the movie. Nate what is an Asian movie? The Asian movie where a blind man kidnapped a woman figure out of his art. She is in a giant sculpture. Do you know what that is? Asian movie where a blind man kidnapped a woman. No, that doesn't sound familiar. I, don't I, mean, I obviously don't <laughs> don't know. Um, Anyone knows, answer the question. Yeah. We probably got like two people watching. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. We'll get people watching after the fact. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, so there, I think there's a lot going on with the, the mother-in-law character. And she. The, one of the things I liked about her was her striking appearance compared to the yeah. white streaks in her hair. I thought she looked really cool. Uh, which is one of, the things, one of the things I got from watching these movies is how the cinematography and the, the the set design overall set design for the two movies we watched were so really like fucking immersive, especially right. in Onibaba. Like in that grass, man. That it was grass, like in man. another world. And like yeah. the grass, it looks like a bunch of blades because mm -hmm. of the, the the black and white. It looked, yeah. it looked like 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 the, the curve of a katana, you know, just kind of swaying in slow motion and and there's even a beautiful shot in the woman in the snow in Kaidan where it's just a shot of the wind blowing the the, the trees and mm -hmm. the, the snow all over them. It was just beautiful and creepy. Um, yeah, th and that's what this movie, that's where the horror in this movie comes from, really, to me, is uh, it's the same kind of horror you see in a post-apocalyptic movie. Yeah, yeah. Where you got cannibals and you've got I mean they're they're probably one step away from eating these Doomsday. You ever see the movie Doomsday with yeah. Ron Mitra? That's there's elements of that in this. Well, I guess this and that, but because it's way older, you know, newer. But I saw some some things in that as uh like what you're saying. The 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 will to survive and what people will do to survive is what kind of Yeah. You know, and 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 then just the raw sexuality of, or God, yeah, the the power of lust. Like this was one of the most sexual films I've ever watched, just because of the raw uh, desire yeah. for 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 mating. That that when you when you take away, and that's something you don't see in some post apocalypse. I mean, you see shades of it, but if there were no laws and there were no uh, there was, uh, you know, everything's out the window. I mean, we go back to the the brutal times of rape and shit like that. But but this one, ex this one explores the se sexuality of the women and the desires of the women as well. Which in the sixties, yeah, yeah. And that was a different thing because even though this guy's a beast and he's not exactly attractive, or, or uh, and he acts like that. There's a like, great scene where he wants her so bad and he like just starts running through the grass. He's like, ah, he's going crazy. He's rolling on the ground and it's all sexual frustration. And, and you know, there's a wants, lot of that. Wants her. Yeah. yeah and she but, does. She wants to go every oh, yeah. night to see him. 
And it's just that to me, I had not seen, I don't know if I've seen that type of story. It's definitely not from 1964. No. <laughs> and like, again, you know, you see, you see them sleeping at night next to each other, topless. And you're, and you're like, it's kind of alarming where you're watching. It's like, whoa, I wasn't expected all that. And then like, even the director said, you know, I wanted to see the difference between the older woman's breasts and the younger woman's breasts. And, the, you know, and uh, he made the clo- he made he said it in summer because he wanted to give them the thinnest clothing possible. Mm-hmm. So like that scene where she's like beating on the the first sensual scene where she's like cleaning the the laundry where he's fishing and he sees her and you know she's sitting there legs spread out this yeah. you know and just sweating and and he's lusting after her right then and there like he wants her and, and you, you kind of see I can get through, I can get I, I know why he wants her wow I mean she's it is very essential. And then she comes in and she's the older lady and she's trying to prevent it because, you know, she could be alone if this guy, these two get together. But, but at the same time, when she sees them making love, she starts to want to make love. She wants to. And I, I think it is. I think it's part of her lust, but it also is part of her fear of, well, I need to win him over or they're going to they're going to turn against me and leave me or kill me or, or who knows. Hmm. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Definitely. There is. And that's what's really going on. And, exciting and, about the movie. Yeah. Well, in the, eventually when the samurai, uh, with the, uh, demon mask shows up, that's when it kind of, <clears throat> like you kind of get like, cause the movie, when I was watching, it, I was like, this movie's just, like super sexual, like when, you know, when's the horror element coming in? And I, I can see where there's horror in this movie, you know, early on because of yeah. what, what we just spoke about. But then that, this guy, the samurai comes out of nowhere and in, into the grass with this, you know, demon mask. I love how cocky he is. Yeah. You know, and talking about how beautiful his face is. And then eventually re- it's revealed that he's kind of grotesque yeah. under there but uh I, I like the 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 scheme that the mother-in-law comes up with to stop to stop all this to try to stop it you know and and donning the mask and that shot of her kind of gliding through the grass is such yeah. a i love that shot it's cool it's cool and that yeah. that whole that whole story is also, I think, an, an old legend that this movie is based on of yeah. a, a woman who gets the demon think, hag, right? <laughs> yeah, the demon hag. I think the the story was that the the woman didn't the, the daughter in law or daughter goes to the temple to pray to Buddha every night or every day, and she doesn't like that because she wants her to be working. Mm. So she thinks she's like praying too much and not working, doing her cut her share of the work. So she puts that mask on to scare her but then buddha makes punishes her for for this by making it stick to her face uh where she, she can't come off so and that that scene right there man i felt that in my gut when she's trying to get that mask off the the desperation and fear and panic and screaming mm-hmm. and everything yeah that was one of the most frightening scenes i've seen and it was i could feel her panic and her terror and her desperation and that's her performance. So, yeah. And that's something I, I wanted to ask about was with that. Is there a supernatural element to this mask? You Definitely know, cause it has to be. yeah. Like, cause I'm, I'm like, there, there's nothing supernatural about the movie up until this point. It's where like a she, possession, I think. Or, or, right. Yeah. So she's got this mask on and can't get up, but What the what the daughter in law does? Is, yeah, she just beats the with the fucking hammer. It's like goddamn. This, the the last is she trying to help her? Or is she trying to like shut her up? I, you know? I think, <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like you, yeah. you you get you could be either way because of what has been going on throughout the movie. Then she finds out you know she's under the mask and she starts hammering away at the mask and it's like I feel like she was doing it not to help her you know to liberate her almost in a way yeah. because i don't well, know she lied she lied to her she mm-hmm. she tricked her so there, there's there's a motive behind it yeah 
Um, one other thing I wanted to, before, you know, I forget, um, uh, you talked about this guy's films and how I many, he was kind of an indie guy and this film was, I think, low budgeted and the way he made this movie is really interesting. Um, they built camps in that grass area, like where they were shooting, mm -hmm. uh, like camps and the entire cast and crew stayed together in those like buildings that they made or tents or whatever during the whole production. So like everyone, they all slept together, ate together and they got up and they worked and then they went back to the camp together, ate, slept, got up, worked. And they, they, he goes, you know, we all had outside lives. We had wives, kids, all that stuff, but they didn't get to see them. They were there for the time that they shot that movie, all living together. He goes, and that created the the feel of the movie because they were all together in it cast crew everyone Some guerrilla filmmaking yeah For so real. they were there and, and that energy and that uh support and everything kind of really reflected in the in the production in the final film yeah you could tell for sure i didn't realize how that was very low budget the way it's shot is it doesn't look a low budget uh, I definitely like to see that movie I mentioned earlier. Which, uh, what was it called? Con His other Con movie. Yeah, I need to watch that one. Is that on Wait, HBO? I no, unfortunately, it's not streaming. Uh, Let me see. What was it? What's it called again? Uh, I, I may be pronouncing it wrong, but it's Kronico. It's K U R. -O uh, it's on the Criterion Channel. I could watch. Oh, is it? it? Okay. Yeah. It says, uh, in this poetic and atmospheric horror fable set in a village in war-torn medieval Japan, a malevolent spirit has been ripping out the throats of an itinerant samurai. When a military hero is sent to dispatch the unseen force, he finds that he must struggle with his own personal demons as well. From Kaneto Shindo, director of the terror classic Onibaba Koreneko, which stands for Black Cat, it's a spectacularly eerie twilight tale with a shocking feminist angle evoking through ghostly special effects and exquisite cinematography. One of the things I read about this, though, is we how but one of the things that really attracted me to it was the um, how we talk about the grass and how oppressive it is. And this one, the setting is around like a bamboo valley and he uses oh. the bamboo instead of uh, the grass. And I'm like, whew. That's like how thick bamboo can be, and like I'm sure there's a lot of and visual the sound, like the sound yeah, of bamboo. Because yeah. like, I, I, you know, I went to Hawaii like a couple of years ago, and so I went into this part of the there were woods where there was just all these bamboo trees, which I'd mm. never experienced before, and like just the sound of bamboo tree, like the, the, the way they, the way they in the wind and they mm -hmm. clack together, and um, I, I, yeah, I'm gonna watch that one probably this week yeah uh, let me know how it is uh, well, how did you get the criterion channel what's it through uh, it's just on your roku or you know smart tv it's just, it's just another app. It's about, yeah it's another it's like oh. ten, 10 bucks a month or something like that okay i might have to indulge it's myself totally totally worth it because like not only again not only do you get the movies but you get all the special features that come oh, on you do? Blu-rays and DVD. yeah so oh, like wow. every time i watch a movie i can go watch like the commentary i can watch uh, all the interviews or behind the scenes stuff or, you know, or there's special TV things, special things that Criterion produces where, you know, say a director is invited on the Criterion to pick like Ari Aster says, all right, I want to, Hey, Ari, pick five movies that you want to show and host or talk about. And so he'll pick five movies that are in the Criterion collection and then he'll talk about them. So you can watch like Guillermo del Toro talk about Kaidan you know, mm -hmm. before you watch it or for five minutes or six minutes and talk about what he loved about it and all that. So you can get all this extra stuff or you can find interviews from, there was a, for, for Kaidan, there was um, an interview with the director, Kobayashi being uh, interviewed by another classic. I can't remember which one it was. It was another classic uh, Japanese filmmaker who was kind of a peer. And he was asking him about the production of the movies. And he's, that's when he talked about, the money issues and how they got, you know, 
hundred million yen to make that movie, and then they ran out of money, and then you know they sent a hatchet man and <laughs> try to you know all these things he had to do. Uh, and like, what do you do when you run out of money? He goes, we, he goes, well, any directors probably dealt with that. He goes at least three times, <laughs> you know. And he talked about like he had his own studio. He made his own studio at that time, and he they were comparing him to Coppola. Like, yeah, Coppola did that and failed, you know. And he started laughing and. Um, but yeah, you get all these, uh, so you're not just getting the movies, you're getting all the, uh, extra stuff. Um, I may, I may have to, I just got rid of Paramount plus. I may have to, cause I was I'm paying attention to your list, your top 100. And I made the comment the other day, I've seen one of your t- first uh, 35 <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I can't I remember which one it was. Uh, oh, it was, uh, the innocence. The innocence, which we watched for the show. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and uh, but now it's two because or three. Yeah, you just, I, I, what was yeah, one? Twelve Angry uh, Men and then, Twelve Angry uh, Men. Yeah, Twelve Angry Men. I love that movie. That was another film yeah. was lit movie. Uh, and then and of course this one here, Oni Baba. Uh, but I, I can't wait to see what else is on there because I know I've seen more Criterion. Yeah, you know, how you get up there? Yeah, because they they not they don't just release foreign films. I mean, they've got no, Night, no. Of, Night of Living Dead. They've got you know, Lambs, 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 yeah. Rosemary's Baby, and you know, so there's like a lot more. You know, I even like Chasing Amy and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot. I think was Robocop. Did I see Robocop? Robo, Robocop was a Criterion. That's release. weird. Yeah, they even like. I don't know what. The, what was like even some of Michael Bay's movies early on, like where like I think Armageddon and The Rock are criteria released, and wow. um, you know Kevin's like chasing Amy, Ma, not my rats, chasing Amy is. Um, I, this is Spinal I Tap. I mean, there's a lot of um, you know I've never seen that. That's a great movie. Yeah, I've heard. <laughs> There's a, I'm going through that list and I'm looking year by year and I came upon this a spinal tap. I was like, how have I not seen this yet? <laughs> anyway, um, so is there anything else we want to mention about Onibaba? Because I, this one was my, I preferred this one of the, the two movies we watched, I have to say. Um, yeah, not think- because one's really better than the other. This one really just kind of hit me, more, you know, more than yeah. the other one did, if that makes sense. I've seen a lot of Kobayashi films at this point, and I want to see more. I, I liked I liked Kai, Kaidan, um, but I did like Harakiri, which is if you get Criterion, it's on there. I think that's no, that one's not on HBO. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I I really was happy with both of these films. Uh, like I said, the only thing I didn't enjoy was the cup and the tea cup of tea yeah. segment like other than that and it wasn't even that bad it was just no. compared to the other three uh it was my least favorite but there's always that in anthology movies usually so there's always one segment you're like i could not watch that one luckily it's the last one so you can just turn it off after the first three yeah um, that's true i i gotta be honest when i was watching that one i was like do i really need to finish this one because it, i just wasn't like I guess connecting with it as much, you know, where the yeah. other three, yeah, there, you got there's a, a kind of a not emotional response, but you I was responding to them if that makes sense, you know. This one I just wasn't as as much responding to as far as the, the four stories go. Uh, I, I would rather go back and rewatch the credits again because actually I like the credits for uh, Kaida and it was that was really. Not what I expected, <laughs> I gotta say. That was a good way to open up the movie. Um, and Oni Baba, man, it's it's filmed beautifully, it feels very oppressive. There's sexual frustration everywhere. It feels, it feels like a filmmaker saying, I want to make whatever the fuck I want. Yeah, I about Oni Baba, that. that seems like it's a rule breaker movie where. Especially yeah. for 1964. If yeah. that was shown in America, which I'm not sure if it was. I don't know how that'd go over in America and in '64. Like I said they gave it an X in yeah. Britain, in England. So. Yeah, well, they're prudes over there. Yeah, they were kind of prudes. Yeah, uh, I mean, like they but have I, that whole video nasty list, and some of them are like seriously. I think it's just this this beautiful exercise in primitive humanity at its at its core of 
survival and part of survival is reproduction and sex and yeah well yeah uh, obviously i mean so can't uh, have new uh, people without sex no so it's <laughs> That's I think overall what won me over as I'm watching the movie. I'm like, holy shit! I this movie is catching me off guard completely. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you know, the horror I think is not about that mask and the ghost shit and whatever you want to call it, the supernatural part. It's really the horror of humanity when uh, there's no law, no rules, and no, and we're at we just trying to survive at all costs and what people will have to do. Like we, we see that in movies where people are like, well, my husband's off to war and I have to fend, but mm -hmm. like, we don't see like, <laughs> you know, the wife and daughter, like murdering, you know, travelers and, and bartering and, uh, you know, whatever they have to do to, Keep, to keep going, you know, and then the guy's like, Hey, you know, I'll have sex with me. I'll give you more. It's just, Hachi. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Gosh. Uh, here, take he, my face. Yeah. Yeah. He's such a creep, man. Yeah. It's you look uh, at that, that grin on his face. <laughs> Cause you just expect that he's going to rape her, but she, oh, she yeah. willingly goes to him. Like she, she, she's lusting for him as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a very, very interesting film. Yeah. Uh, so that leads me to the question. Onibaba recommend or. Oh, hands down. Yeah. yeah. Like, out of out of the uh, you know, another one, Ugetsu is on HBO as well. So if you want to check that one out, that What's was a really good one. Ugetsu, it's like U G E T S U. That one's very haunting. It feels more like the silent horror films we used to see, like uh, the the German Expressionists. Or, or there's there's some really haunting imagery in that. Uh, and then this is again, it's got great stories, so uh, and that was a highly influential. I think that's one of those movies you'll hear like Scorsese, From, people uh, talk 1953. About. yeah, that's one where you'll hear like great, great, great filmmakers from uh, yesteryear talk about how it's one of those movies that had images and things and scenes. I'm pretty sure Scorsese is a big fan of that one. This, there's a I just checked it out on uh, Google. Google has their own review audience rating summary. There's only 17 ratings, but all 17 are 5.0 for Ugetsu. So that's pretty interesting. You never see that. 5.0 out of 5 stars. So no. maybe I'll check that one out. I was on um, my list. I, it was on uh, my 100. It was on was it? Other, yeah. You're just trying to get me to uh, watch more of your 100. That's <laughs> <laughs> You haven't seen enough of my 100. Well, no, you seem to dig these two, so I thought well, I really liked uh, uh, Only Baba. Baba. That was I, I really yeah. This one there was like so many different emotions and reactions, and you know, in this movie, it's like I didn't know how to feel about. I liked it, but I didn't know how to feel about some of the things that were happening in the movie. You know, it's like. But it was a good story overall. I I like, like that you, fucking. I love that mask, by the way. I yeah, I do. Really I want to get mask. one. You you can get them. They're like some classic, like part of like because you know it comes from the the Japanese have their own plays, and one type of play they have is the no play, which mm. is they all wear masks. Uh, and there's kind of two masks. That's one it's of creepy them. man. Um, Look at that. Yeah. But um, mm. yeah. The, these like this movie if you look at it from a different perspective it's got all of the depravity or violence that some of the horror movies that we worship and preach about in the 70s like it's got all the energy of oh, last yeah. house or texas yeah. chainsaw or hills have eyes or oh something. yeah i can see that it's definitely hills have it, it kind of, mm. i almost got some hills have eyes vibes because hills have eyes is based on the sonny bean legend which is mm. about a family of cannibals preying on travelers and robbing from them, stealing them and eating them. Uh, these, these women are one step away from eating these guys. So I know, right? Yeah. So <laughs> if you look at it, they, this is a movie about villains. Uh, where the three leads are killers, murderers, opportunistic thieves. Uh, killers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but they're doing it out of necessity, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. it's like, it's a moral, 
more morality it, it, play. Yeah, it's like what else? What, what else are you gonna do? It, it, it's it's adapt or survive, in a way, you know. Yeah. And that's what they're. That's how you have to adapt to the life that they're given, and and the especially their surroundings, which I love. I love the setting of this movie. That's one yeah. of the best things about this movie is the setting in general. Not 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 the time setting. Well, that helps, but like the the, the grass, that tall the tall grass. grass it's called a uh, or I can't remember. It's, it's a type, type, certain type of grass. It starts with an S. Yeah, it's it's uh. Oh. Let's look it up, but uh, yeah, I I personally uh, will I recommend these movies, uh, especially Oni Baba and I like three of the four segments of uh, <laughs> of uh, Kaiden. Oh, if you like sur- like if you like ghost stories and surreal fantasy fairy tale, if you again we talked about Labyrinth and uh, Prince's Bride, that kind of just immerse yourself into a fantastical beautiful like old school hollywood technicolor kind of settings where you know like like the wizard of oz you watch the wizard of oz and it's so phony you got the painted sky background (laughs) like but there's something so cool about that like i want to make a movie Uh, even pearl kind of had that touch of oh yeah old school i don't think they had the painting background i don't think they did that pearl looked like it was filmed in the 30s though yeah but I really love like like the the red shoes or black black narcissist or it's it's like looking at a stage play, mm-hmm. but with a huge budget, you know, where they could build like I mean they're like the the ghost one or the snow one you know you got like a lake with a waterfall in, in there that's all in a well, in an air hangar you know I know, you know that's wild to think in about. a forest and everything's covered in snow yeah. and. The, you could see the snow blowing, and it felt just real enough. But then you got the sky that's got all these weird eyeballs watching you, and, and storms, and see and the, the Japanese. Lighting. The Japanese have such a unique vision for uh, just film in general, but cinematography and like some of the thing, like going. I, I got to tell you, this is an untapped. Uh, you know, genre, I guess, is, or I don't know what to call it, or older Japanese films, because I have seen the, you know, the J-horror craze of the early 2000s, like um, Ichi the Killer. I've seen some, I haven't seen the whole thing, but, uh, you know, Juon and uh, The Ring and all that stuff. I've seen a lot of these, and, and I kind of, this is an untapped thing for me because I'd never thought about going back, and the Japanese are so visual first of all and it's so different from what you see you know from western films even even just italian i mean i because you know i watch a lot of italian movies and you know it's just so different and it's for me watching um you can almost see it on baba in uh, in some of this stuff like i could see that for sure yeah yeah, like there's some some relative it's very it all comes back from stuff before that, you know, like yeah. it's very German expressionist or well, filmmakers. Like I, I think a lot of them, and you probably can relate to this, are are definitely influenced by different films and and even it's weird. Like it, it's almost like like there could be a, like a circle of life with filmmakers of, you know, well maybe Bava was influenced by, you know, Shindo's films. But maybe he's also influenced by what Bava has done if he's seen them. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, and all because, and, and all those Japanese guys are competing, you know, with each other, trying to one up each other. Like, yeah. you know, all of them are probably competing with Kurosawa. Well, uh, when, when Kobayashi, well known, yeah, know. when Kobayashi was like asked about Kurosawa, you could almost see like there was a little bit of like, oh, that guy. Yeah, we don't, yeah, don't talk about that guy. You talk about me right now. You know, <laughs> there's a little bit of that. But everybody knows Kurosawa. Yeah, even, uh, even <laughs> Kobayashi when he did Kaidan, you know, there's a again going back to the extra stuff on the Criteria Channel. There's like almost an hour long conversation. I think he was the production. He was either the production guy. I think he was maybe the assistant director or production manager. But he talked about a lot about what it was like working with him and making that movie and all the struggles and all the things they did. And he said that. Uh, Kobayashi, um, he would talk to the crew and the art people about tone 
but he wouldn't tell you what to do. He left it up to the crew to come up with things and be creative themselves. He goes, which was very rewarding to everyone because they got to be a part of it. He goes, mm. now he would tell you what he likes and don't like, you know. And he, he what he what he did was he gave him a book. He went he goes he we would go to a bookstore, and he would buy art books. And I, he goes he wouldn't just buy Japanese art books. He'd buy Picasso books and books from all over, like artists all over the world. And he would find images and colors and he would cut them out with scissors and he would tape them into this book and he would hand it to us and say, right, these are the colors I want. These are the tones. These are the images. These are the things that I want when making that movie. And he would hand it to his art department and say, you know, go like, show me what you want to do and what you can do. Um, and so you get good stuff like that on the Criterion channel as well. Good. You're not going to get on HBO. You're not going to get anything. I, you're probably devouring the Criterion Channel alive. Like, yeah, you know, you know like I, you. I got it for like my 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 sister uh, sister in law gave us some money for Christmas, and I was like, well, I don't know what I want. I was like, what I really want is Criterion Channel, but you know, so I was like, I'm, I'm gonna take her money and do the pay for three months or whatever of Criterion Channel with with this Christmas money, mm. and now I'm like, yeah, I'm probably gonna keep it. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way I can give it's it something. So, it's, that's so you, you yeah. Because I've got it. You know. I've got like 300 movies in my queue right now, and I'm and every time I I watch a, a filmmaker talk about film, and they'll say this movie, I'm like, I haven't heard of that. And I go to Criterion Channel. They have got it. <laughs> you know, it's like so, yeah, and they don't just cool. have their movies either because they'll do like a, a block of movies that maybe they it's not part of their collection, but you know, like they did a when I first signed on they had a, a screwball comedy thing. So they had like, you know, a lot of movies you saw, the Cary Grant movies. They, yeah, had, uh, Grant, yeah. they had like, you know, uh, the lady Eve and the awful truth. And it happened one night and uh, you know, just t like, I don't know, 20 screwball comedies of that era. And like the, the Dick movie that you. <laughs> well, they, well, they did. Well, the, no, they didn't have that one, but um they did have a noir section. There's all these mm. noir films. And then they had, they'll, they'll pick an actor or a filmmaker and they'll just have a bunch. Like they had a, a Gil, was it Galil Pilil, the guy, the, the, the Aborigine guy that was in like Crocodile Dundee and Walkabout. Um, you remember, he's like the one where she's like trying to take his photos. Oh, you can't take me photographs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you got lens cap on. Like, you know, he's a big actor over in Australia. And they had this, like a ton of his movies on there and his, a documentary about them um, that all leave this month. So I've tried to watch a bunch of those. Um, but that's the cool thing. Like, you'll say, all right, it's, it's Bergman month, and they'll have like all of Bergman's movies. Uh, they have almost all his movies on there, actually. And, and then, uh, so you could go, you can say, well, I just want to look at this filmmaker. We can look at like Shin, Shindo or, or Kobayashi, and they'll have bulk of their films and then all these other people all these extras about them and documentaries about them and i like shindo's work the one thing i've seen so far yeah you know, like so yeah. i watched I'm, i want to watch this other one you talked about but also i've watched before we came on there's a movie that uh, benicio del toro just the naked kiss or something the naked or, island, the naked and, island. And, and he had gotten to meet him and there's a video on you on it's on youtube i think as well maybe that's on the criterion of him meeting him and talking to him and asking about that movie. He said, because he saw on a Bobby on a Baba. That was the first movie he saw and he was just taken by it. So he started trying to find other movies by him. And a friend of him said, here, check this out. And it was the naked Island. And the naked Island is this movie. It's almost a silent film, but it's not a silent film, but there's almost no dialogue. And it's about an hour, 20 minutes, hour and 30 minutes. And it's just about this family of four, this husband and wife and their two sons who live on this island in like as part of Hiroshima. But they live on an island by themselves, farming, growing sweet potatoes. <laughs> and they have to take it shows them the struggles they have to do to survive where they have to take the boat. They can't they have to get water from the mainland. So they have to take a boat every day, fill up two buckets full of water sail back across to their island, carry these heavy buckets of water up the hill to their garden to water, which the director said it's kind of bullshit because 
sweet potatoes don't need that much water <laughs> to grow. <laughs> but he said, you know, basically you're watching them do this. And then, you know, they're two sons. And it's just about the struggle of these two people, these farmers who have to survive and work their asses off every day for so little. And it, I don't want to go into what it goes, but it's like this portrait that really touched Benicio. Like he saw it. And he was just really moved by the movie. And, uh, I actually love Benicio del Toro. Yeah, I do too. So, yeah. I saw him in uh, usual suspects first. Well, and then, uh, yeah. <laughs> What does he say? Give the keys, motherfucker. Give the keys, motherfucker. Oh, that's right. Give the keys, motherfucker. You mean the hooker with uh, dysentery? Uh, but okay. yeah, I saw him in that, and then I saw him in a movie called Excess Baggage with Alicia Silverstone. Oh, yeah. Fun movie. And then, of course, um, he blew me away in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. So after that, I was like, I love this guy. He can do anything, and he can. Um Man, we could talk forever. Uh, I, I want to. I'm going to wrap this up though because yeah. we, we probably could. I didn't know uh, we were going to talk about this much because you said, "Oh, Seth's not joining us, and Jared's too busy." I, to I watched it, man. I, I didn't, and I'm like, "Oh man, it's going to be a I, short episode." <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not gonna lie. I I, uh, I dreaded watching these. Well, I remember you you were watching Kai Day, and you're like, "I don't know. I feel asleep watching it. I don't." Know. I did. I fell asleep. It's long, watching. man. It's three hours long. <laughs> well, I saw three hours. I'm like shit, I didn't know this was going to be this long. So I started watching it, and I. I like I really like the opening, like the like we talked about the credits, and then it gets in the story and I start dozing off. I'm like shit. <laughs> don't fall asleep. And I fell asleep and I woke up in the middle of uh uh the third story. I'm like, okay, so I gotta restart this. <laughs> but I restarted and I ended up enjoying a watch. I think I was just really tired. Uh I've been my sleep's been weird the last couple of weeks. Like last night I fell asleep at like two o'clock in the morning and woke up at four and I've been up since then. So yeah, it's it's been jacked up. Anyway, uh, and then I really really enjoyed Oni Baba. I think um, the thing that uh, the re I didn't, I've never really enjoyed uh, and then this like I said earlier this the, you can't really say this is in the same league as J, the J horror craze, but like Juan and Ringu, I've seen them, but I didn't really enjoy them. If that makes sense. I got so, really tired of J horror quick. Like yeah. I I mean my introduction to it was. Um, the ring yeah like the american the gore verbinski remake. yeah yeah me too yeah. and then i went back and watched ringu yep and then i watched the grudge the american version and didn't really like it but then i watched juan and was terrified by it. i thought juan was great yeah there's another guy i haven't seen i have not seen pulse oh you haven't seen pulse and that's that's a kurosawa right that guy's last name is kurosawa yeah, i believe so. i haven't seen that but i hear he's amazing and criterion put one of his movies out called cure which i've never seen which is in my queue and so i want to watch cure and pulse because i have pulse on dvd and i have cure in my queue <laughs> um so i want to watch that guy's movies because people who like him like him a whole lot praise him um and hell he's in the criterion now um but I really got tired of J-Horror. I, I mean, my friend of mine was really, like, uh, when I started my, co when I worked in comics back in, like, 2001, I guess maybe I saw this before The Ring. Because we were talking about movies, and the guy, Bruce, who was one of our writers, was obsessed with Itchy the Killer. Mm -hmm. And Itchy the Killer had just come out. A lot of people are. Yeah, and I went and, why, I went and rented it and was like, holy shit. Like, I mean, when a movie's title appears in semen, you know you're in for something new, different. And and then I uh, was up at uh, the video store, like Hollywood Video, and uh, saw Audition, and oh, saw, yeah. it was, saw it was a Takashi Miike film. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna check this out, and really liked Audition. So I started watching a bunch of Takashi Miike films after that, like Visitor Q and gozu and all that stuff um the cast made like over 100 movies so i haven't yeah, seen I, I, see that's the thing i don't know why these didn't like uh work for me and that's why i was like dreading watching these i was like the japanese horror movies i've seen i've only liked a couple maybe if that i've seen felt, a few some of them felt so repetitive like again they had yeah. the girls with the long dark hair mm -hmm. and they were that usually, was the thing they were usually tech based they were yeah. usually about a cell phone or mm -hmm. a computer or a which i gotta admit pulse, pulse isn't bad i think you might like that one i think i like pulse i've yeah. seen clips and i'm like oh wow um 
and just its reputation and his, and his yeah. reputation. Uh, I'm really curious about Cure. I don't know anything about it, but I've never heard I of that one. See, it. see if that's one, that one's available. Maybe that can go on one of our. Uh, yeah. Is it a horror movie? Yeah, it's a horror movie. Well, maybe that can go Same on. Same guy that. made Pulse. Um. So yeah, I, I wasn't into J horror that much. I mean, there was the other guy. Um, guy, the guy that made Midnight Meat Train. <laughs> Kitamura. Yeah. Uh, I'd seen Versus, which was a kind of a zombie movie that he did. That was the first thing I saw of his. And uh, he did a movie called Origami. Origami that reminded me of uh, Dracula. It was a short film. Um, but he also did stuff like um, Azumi, which was a really cool samurai movie. It came around, around 2003 or so. And then he did a movie called Downrange a few years ago. It was an Australian or American. I mean, it was an English-speaking movie. Yeah, he did Midnight Me Train. It was like his first English movie, maybe. Uh, but I think he's a good filmmaker. But I, I, yeah, the Japanese, like when it came to Japanese filmmaking, uh, you know, there was Beat Takashi. There was um, what Takeshi, Battle Royale. Um, Stuff like that, but I hadn't watched a lot of older films other than the Kura Kurosawa. And then with watching all these other things, I got Ozu. I kept hearing about Ozu, so I watched Tokyo Story, which is like usually one of the top ten films of all time. And I fell in love with what he does. And he's he's not horror. Or anything. His movies are just about normal people, normal families in Japan in this at that time. And but he's got this really unique style where he puts the camera down. You know, when in Japan sits when they're inside, you know, sitting mm -hmm. on the floor. So the camera's always at your level where you're if you're seated. So it's low, and it's always it's usually of of an area where everyone's in the same frame. It's not a lot of cutting, and it's it's just late spring in Tokyo story blew me away. Like, and I started watching all all his movies as much. Well, I haven't seen them all because he's made a shitload. But a lot of them are on HBO. Um, You've seen a shitload, though. <laughs> I've seen a lot, but I'm there's like that's the thing. Like I'm not running out of anything. Like there's always, it's almost like I'm overwhelmed by how much I have yeah, there, in my queue. There are thousands of movies produced a year. It seems like at this point. Oh, there are, and that's what I said. Like you know, Sean talked about y'all watch a lot of old movies because there's so many great movies we met we never saw because yeah. we weren't around. And that's the thing. Like, I literally have a treasure trove of the best films ever made all around the world. And we just got to see two of them this week, I think. And yeah. Yeah. I, I like, I just text Seth uh, because he, I, I don't think he really wanted to watch these, that uh, he should at least check out Oni Baba because I really uh, enjoyed that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think he'd appreciate that. And, and Jerry, like the, snow, the woman, he's not a big ghost guy, though. No, he's that's Chad why, yeah, like, that's why I was like, eh, maybe not. Only Bob is not really a ghost story, but no, it's there's there's a lot to Only Baba, I think. Um, but I know, I know Jared would definitely appreciate these two movies. This dude just fucking yeah. working, you yeah. know. Uh, so I didn't think he would be on because uh, how much time we had to watch well, he messaged films. me this morning at 6 30 saying he just got off of a double i'm like shit are you gonna be on the show he's like i won't have time to watch the movies i'm like oh, all right buddy <laughs> well i'm sorry you know uh nope. so that's we okay we had a good week. time i think right yeah that's, we had a good time yeah let's talk about it I'm, I'm i'm glad that you liked them because i was like man it might be a a boring show <laughs> no it's uh we had a good discussion about it and hearing your uh your uh, interpretations of some of the things that were going on versus what I was thinking. It's always fun to find out what other people are thinking, you, you know, when you're, when you're talking about uh, the same movie, you know, because everybody has different feelings and different reactions and stuff like that. Anyway, so that this was a good, good episode for me. And I hope people watch this one because these are two movies, in my opinion, that should be seen. Uh, and I know both of them actually, especially only Baba. Uh, I was reading that, they they couldn't define the genre that this movie belonged in, which yeah. I thought was really interesting. Well, I, I, I there's a lot of elements from different things. It's just yeah, I don't know what to call it because it's not an action movie. I mean, it's no. just a drama, but it has the horror. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I mean, that's what great films should be und undefinable. 
Um, but so uh, next week we were going to do Dragon of Hell, but I realized next week is the beginning of February, and February for us is Zombie Month, and we're going to do something that I fucking love, which is the remake of George Romero's classic legendary Night of the Living Dead. Now, I think Night of the Living Dead 1990s Tom Savini's movie stands on its own yeah. uh, in a lot of ways. I cannot wait to talk about it. This is one of my favorite. So that's what we're doing movies. next week. We're going to do this next week. We're going to push Drag Me to Hell because it's zombie month. It's February. And then after that, we're going to do Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead, which okay. I love, followed by one of the best zombie movies of the last seven or eight years, 10 years, 15 years, which is Train to Busan. Um, I saw that he's got a new movie on Netflix, the director that's getting all kinds of great comments. What is it called? Really? It's like, yeah, I just read it before the show tonight. Uh, the director of Train to Busan uh, took a picture. So I remember it, but it's on Netflix, I believe. It's called Jung E. Jung E. Yeah. J U N G uh, E. <laughs> And it's a brand new sci-fi thriller that debuted last week is already rocking the Netflix charts. It's wow. a gripping sci-fi thriller hailing from the mind of Yun Sang Ho, who also gifted us Train to Busan. Train to Busan, yeah. It's a new film is currently sitting at number one spot on Netflix's top ten. Oh quality. wow. Okay. Well, Train to Busan, uh, I can't wait to talk about it also because this is one of the most gut wrenching, heart heart breaking movies of all time especially in the genre. Um, and then after that, we've, we're going to do another two for our two, two, two you've never seen, but uh, we got to find two zombie movies. Two zombie movies. Just, All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll start searching. Yeah. You, you're the searcher. You're the, you're the guy that comes up with the, the good shit. <laughs> so, and then, then in March, we'll get to uh, drag. They, they, they made love. like 500 zombie movies in the 2000s. Just, so. just do me a favor. Uh, don't, don't, have us watch the movies called the dead i've seen both of them and i didn't care for them did you see those movies the dead no. they're af south african i think super boring um yeah they're zombie movies i remember i was in this uh this horror group early on and they kept talking about how great this movie was and i i found it at walmart for five bucks i was like oh shit, let me check this out and i was dreadfully bored out of my mind because it was like I, this is terrible. I love Lord of the Rings, but it's a lot of walking and and not much dialogue and not much zombies really. So I didn't really care for it. But I don't know. Maybe I need to give it another look. But uh, that's another that's another topic we could come up with is uh, movies we didn't care for. Uh, let's give it another look, another go. You know, uh, if we didn't like something because you know we talk about the 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 I'm going to call it the Saunders rule. Uh, sometimes it takes a couple times to, to really get into something, you know, because uh, when Keith brought that up, I was like, OK, let me watch a couple things again, because I didn't like Mother the first time I saw it. I ended up liking it. I didn't really care for the witch, but I, that's still a bad theatrical uh, situation for me. But um, anyway, we've got a lot of good stuff coming. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, our content coming up with Drag Me to Hell's coming, Night of Living Dead, 1990, a couple of the Romero remakes. We will not talk about Day of the Dead because that either one of them are really bad. Um, so I haven't seen the second remake of Day of the Dead, but I know the first one's terrible. I've seen that one. But uh, Train to Busan should be fun. And I know that Jared loves that one, so hopefully we'll get Jared back, and Seth will be back next week as well. It's okay to miss an episode once in a while. Anyway, Nate, thanks for picking these movies out. They were a lot of fun. Uh, we'll be back next week with, like I said, Night of Living Dead 1990. So prepare for that. I cannot wait to watch it. I love that movie. I just fucking love it. Um, and you know, I've said this before. I saw it before I ever saw the original. So I don't. I think I saw the original first, but yeah, I really like this one. Yeah, it prompted me to go see the. The thing I like about this one, first of all, I absolutely adore Tony Todd. I, he's one of my favorite actors in the genre, and maybe period. There's something, and plus, he's got that great voice, and he's got the presence about him in everything he's in. And uh, Patricia Tallman put, puts in this performance that totally shifts the way you look at Barbara from Night of the Living Dead. Mm -hmm. so, and she's just generally a stunt actress. So uh, anyway, we'll talk about that next week on uh, Wednesday when we do the Horse and Nicket Discourse. We're in what, season four now? Night of the Living Dead. Tons of movies still to get to. So stick around, subscribe, all that good stuff. Nate.
Thanks for hanging out. Uh, we'll see you next week. We'll see everybody else next week. Watch more horror movies and check out Oni Baba and say it again. Kaiden. Kaiden. Yeah. Kaiden. 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 HBO Max. Have a great night. We'll see you next week.